Um, my talk today is, uh, as the title says, about the everyday occupation of Palestine. And actually, George, if we can dim the lights, that would be helpful. Because I can use a microphone if you want me to, yeah. Is that loud? Okay. I have no, no idea how this goes. We'll probably work it out. I feel like a pilot, huh? There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So the talk is about the everyday occupation of Palestine. And as George said, uh, this is a talk about Palestine in which you're not going to hear much about one state and two state and three state and no state solutions. You're not going to hear much about Oslo. You're not going to hear much, although I'll mention it in passing, about the bombing of Gaza. I'm not going to be talking so much about the normal large-scale violence that we're used to thinking in terms of when we talk about Palestine and Israel, partly because, although I think those things are important, I also don't think that they're the best way to understand the nature of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. I think rather when we zoom in to the small scale everyday nature of everyday life, that's where I think we get a much better grip on the nature of the occupation and the nature of the political logic underlying the occupation. I started thinking about this, I should say, not in Palestine itself, but rather in the south of Lebanon, the country that I grew up in. Um, Lebanon, the south of Lebanon, is a spectacular, as you can see in these pictures, is a spectacularly beautiful landscape that was uh, distorted for a long time by a long uh, Israeli occupation of the south that finally ended in, in, in 2000. Um, the interesting thing about the south of Lebanon is that its topography is one that introduces you to all kinds of different ways of thinking about political and social space. So most recently, this, these are pictures from my last trip to the South, uh, I guess two years ago. Um, the Israelis have started, I don't know if they had this obsession with walls, but then they started building a wall that looks like their separation wall inside Palestine along, not even along the border, you can't say the border, it's along the blue line, the UN mandated line, that they, or at least their interpretation of the blue line uh, in the South of Lebanon. And it's a landscape that is obviously to this day riven by scars and signs of violence and of uh, war and of the remnants of the Israeli presence. The amazing thing about this landscape, from my perspective as somebody who grew up in Beirut, is of course that you go down to the border with Israel and you look across and literally, like these pictures are taken by me just standing however far away from that, in this particular case, this fortification, or in this particular case, overlooking yet another series of walls that the Israelis love so much. But the amazing thing to me is the proximity to, to Israel, as somebody who grew up in Beirut. The amazing thing about it is that from a Lebanese perspective, when you go down to the border and you look at across at an Israeli settlement like that, for example, you just think it's strange. It's a very, I, I mean, personally, it's a very, very strange feeling because in Beirut, especially, you're used to thinking of Israel as a kind of abstraction. It's a, it's, a, it's a political entity that exists, it does things. It's a political agent, it acts, it does things. But you don't think of it so much as an actual place because you don't go there, right? You can't go there even if you wanted to. And yet you go down and you can look at it. And you can, you can you know, if you look, spend enough time, you can see people coming and going, going to their cars and going about their lives. And it's, it's eerie, it's destabilizing. And I think part of why it's so eerie and strange and kind of unsettling and discomforting is that it's a moment when you can, where sort of political abstractions are concretized, right? So when you look at a bunch of houses, it's a bunch of houses. It's not, it's not an entity, it's not a state. It's a group of houses. And there's a way in which the mundane, quotidian aspect of it actually registers also at the political and at the intellectual level. The other thing about going down to the border and looking across the various walls is that there's this magic moment that happens, again, from a Lebanese perspective, Lebanese-Palestinian perspective, when you go down to the border and look across, and yeah, you look across this fence, across the wall, and into Israel, and then you realize, and it suddenly happens, you re this realization comes to you magically again, you realize you're also looking at Palestine. And you think of all the decades of conflict and war and how many people were killed and the dispossession and the brutalization and the bombing and so on and so forth, and you just think, it's all about that piece of land. And that's actually a very, very powerful, to me, realization. It's, it, 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 again, it's a sort of 
taking vast political ideas, historical conflicts, the displacement of people, 60, dec 60 decades, 60 years of conflict and so forth, and it comes down to this thing that you can literally point at, throw stone at, touch almost, even more, more than almost. There are places on the border, like the Wazani River, where you can go down, and if you wanted to, I didn't try it because I didn't want to push my luck, but you could wade across the border and you'd be in Palestine. Right? So that when you think about how strange it is, this tiny little creek, you just cross this creek and you're in Palestine. There's something magical about that incredible proximity that I think, to my mind, brings down, makes tangible, touch, literally touchable, manifest, uh, uh, proximate, uh, the reality of this long conflict and series of dispossessions and acts of incredible violence. So the border is a place where the sublime encounters the everyday, where the every, the, our, our knowledge of political history and of giant political forces comes down to the level of the everyday, to the mundane. Like this is a creek, on the other side of the creek there's this bank, and that's, that's what this is all about in some fundamental way. It's hard to actually close that circuit. It's hard to think of the connection between this mundane, it's pretty, but it's a mundane landscape, and the giant political forces that we're talking about. It's just, it's a piece of land after all. It's not, it's not a historical force, it's a, it's a piece of land. Um, so to look at the piece of land is then to think about the process of history and historical transformation that led us to where we are now. If you look across the border again, looking down into the Galilee from Lebanon, you're looking at one of the most thoroughly ethnically cleansed places in all of Palestine. If you consider the, the, the situation of what happened here in this landscape historically, if you look, for instance, at a map of the villages that were demolished during Israel's creation in 1948, if you think about the history of the people that were expelled from these villages, and if you think about their proximity of these villages to the border. So when I was taking most of these pictures, I was, the border is this white line. I was standing more or less here, looking down this way, uh, from Lebanon into, into the Galilee. Uh, you see, in fact, a landscape that has been shaped by, transformed by, shaped by, literally made manifest in uh, historical processes in the, in the landscape. Um, it's a landscape that's in effect formed by the process of, of ethnic cleansing and of uh, the displacement of people. So, in fact, if you were to pick in, zoom in on particular villages that were the red dots on those maps that I just showed you, you could find very particular kinds of of places, right? Like Abd al Amr, for example. These are the ruins of a village that was eradicated in 1948 by the Israelis. Their inhabitants, its inhabitants expelled across the border. But you can still go to the land and to another village called Zuh al Tawani, for example. And you can see the ruins of people's houses now overgrown. The trees literally re-anchoring themselves, the bushes coming up through the ruins of the houses, or the village of Shaw al Tahta, another one of these villages, in uh, ruins of one of these villages in, in, in the Galilee, whose people are no longer there. Of course, they're now, God knows where, they're in refugee camps. Uh, they're gone. They're, they're no longer to be seen in this landscape. And then you can go back, as I said, to this map and locate each one of those villages. And of course, then you can produce a narrative of displacement in history and how this happened and so forth. But what I want to emphasize here is that the proximity, that literally the tactility, that you can touch this, you can, you can see the scene of history at the most mundane level, in, 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 in flowers, in roots, in grass, in trees, in the way that these interact with the social, with the built uh, environment. So I want to shift now from looking across the border, across this border, and talk about uh, the occupied territories. I want to talk about the land again, because the land is indeed part of, it's a fact, I would say it's the focal point of the struggle between Israel and the Palestinians, and it has been for a long time. If you look at the way in which Israeli settlement architecture functions, and 
there are many Israeli architects and social planners who have written about this extensively. Um, their social planning, the settlement planning, is always with an eye to domination over the landscape, visually, aesthetically, uh, sort of as a political statement. It's as though one could impose, and in fact one does impose in this case, planning on the landscape, so that you can see planning, lands, literally, the, the fact of lands, something as mundane as landscape planning, as an integral part of an occupation policy. It's not just landscaping, it's part, it's, it's taking the logic of occupation and translating it into the domain of landscaping. Uh, the way the occupation works in Palestine is unlike in Lebanon, where there was a very active military resistance, and the Israelis could never settle down and you know, control things in Lebanon. In Palestine, there is no, in the West Bank especially, there is no meaningful military resistance to the occupation. So what that allows the Israelis to do is to establish the terms of day-to-day -day life. So Israel and the occupation set the rhythm and the tempo of day-to-day -day life in, in Palestine. Um, and what that means is that if you look at planning documents, if you look at maps, this is a map of the area around the village of Kotelia in the northwest of the West Bank. Um, you can see the minuteness with which space has been parceled out, populations have been separated from each other, land has been appropriated, expropriated, people, people have been expelled, houses have been demolished. You can see the way in which the occupation is able to inscribe itself onto the land. And so it's important to think about the nature of a settled occupation, the way in which an occupation is an everyday occupation that settles into it, nestles into the fabric of day-to-day mundane, boring, you know, everyday uh, life. At the level, not just, of course, of landscape and planning and, and housing and so forth, but also at the most mundane, perhaps, level of identity cards. So I'm going to show you a series of pictures of people uh, holding their identity cards. Some, some of these people are Israeli Jews. Some are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Some are Palestinian Jerusalemites or Palestinians from Gaza, or Palestinians from the West Bank. But the point is that if you look at all these people together, holding their state-issued identity cards, part of what they, what this, what they allow you to, what they not allow you, what they compel you to think about is the way in which these identity cards, which are, of course, the expression of state identity, state logic, state thinking, state planning, uh, allows the state to introduce its politics at the level of the individual. So your relationship to your identity card as a Palestinian or as an Israeli, is in fact a direct manifestation of state thought, state logic, and state planning that takes place literally carried in your back pocket. You go around with it, whether you think about it or not. Palestinians have to think about it, because to get from point A to point B in their everyday lives, they are constantly compelled to negotiate an, a wide array of roadblocks and checkpoints and so forth. Jewish Israelis probably can be a bit more uh, uh, oblivious to the to their car because they don't have to use it quite so often to, to navigate their day-to-day -day lives. But nevertheless, your identity card as a Palestinian or as an Israeli determines the nature of your everyday life. For, for example, it determines where you can come and where you can go. It determines where you can live and who you can live with. It determines the nature of your work. It determines whether you can get to school. It determines whether you can travel. It determines whether you can go to school at all. It determines who you can marry. It determines basically almost every facet of your everyday life, and yet you carry this thing around with you in the back of your pocket. It's important to know that for these six different human beings, you look at them and you can see, I think it's obvious, their, fellow, their fellowship in humanity. But as far as the state of Israel is concerned, these six different human beings each have access to a very different menu of rights and prohibitions according to their ethnic and racial and religious identity as defined by the state itself. The state confers upon each of these people, whether they're citizens of the state or whether they're residents of the occupied territories, it confers upon them an identity that it alone controls and determines. And then according to the identity that it has conferred upon these people, that is how they are able or unable or disabled uh, in, the, in the conduct of their everyday lives. So like I said, in terms of getting from point A to point B, uh, something as mundane as going to visit your auntie in the next village, for instance, is determined by what your card does and doesn't allow you to do. So the card, your identity card, which you carry in your back pocket, determines your relationship with the land, for example. In other words, some people can cross the landscape freely, without prohibition, without interdiction, without interruption, 
if you're a Jewish settler or a Jewish Israeli, you can come and go between the West Bank and Israel as freely as you'd like. Nobody ever stops you to ask you where you're going, what your name is, what your occupation is, and so on and so forth. If you're a Palestinian in the West Bank, the matter is obviously completely different because, as I said before, every single movement you, have, you want to make is a matter of negotiating an endless array of Israeli roadblocks and checkpoints and so forth. So the amazing thing about this occupation at the everyday level is that some people are able to live in the 21st century and some people are forced to much older modes of transport because it turns out in this bizarre uh, striation of space and time that the older modes of transport are actually more efficient, it turns out, because they allow you to get from point A to point B more quickly than navigating the array of permits and checkpoints and so forth that the Israelis have set up to regulate everyday life. So if you think about your life as determined by having to navigate this array of checkpoints, if you think about what it means to have your everyday life, literally every day of your life, to have to contend with an attempt, not an attempt, it's an, it's an actuality, of corralling, limiting, controlling, channeling, determining. If you think about what that means, well, that is the politics of occupation. So again, you can think of it in abstract terms. I can give you a whole lecture on the racial politics of Israeli occupation. And yeah, you can give it, it's perfectly valid to think of it in those terms. But you can also think of it in terms of a mother and a son trying to get to school, or trying to get home, or trying to get to the doctor's office, or trying to get to their field, or whatever it is, and having to work their way through an elaborate orchestration of prohibitions and, and confinements and thou shalt nots and, and, and so forth. According to the most recent report published by the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs uh, last month, there are at the moment 490 obstacles interrupting Palestinian movement in the West Bank. That comprises checkpoints, roadblocks, gates, earth mounds, walls, trenches, barriers, and so forth, not one of which applies to Jewish settlers crossing the West Bank. They are not subject to these forms of interdiction. This is a form of inter interdiction and interruption that applies only to one population, not to the other population. That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is to think about the way in which the occupation intrudes into literally your body. So not just the ID card you carry in your back pocket, but also literally the kinds of exposure you have to education, to food, to nourishment, to thought, to religious sites, to things like that. All of which, again, are determined by the identity that you, the, state, the state identifies and pins on you and, and you know, structures your life around. There was an attempt a few years ago, as the Israelis were tightening their siege on Gaza, Israeli state planners, this is actually one of the most remarkable episodes in the entire siege of Gaza, they went through a meticulous series of calculations. Because you know the Israelis control Gaza from the land, sea, and air. They control its borders. They control the movement of goods in and out of Gaza. They know the number of people there. They know its agricultural capacity. They know how many fish the people in Gaza can catch, which is not much. They know everything about it, basically. What the Israelis have been trying to do in their siege is to maintain Gaza in a situation of, um, of not quite starvation. They don't want it to plunge over into an out-and-out -out humanitarian catastrophe. But nor do they want it to be a kind of place where you can live a normal life. They want to keep it exactly at this edge, where at any moment you could plunge over into an abject catastrophe, but you're not really, they don't want that to happen, as long as it doesn't look very good in the world, in world, uh, in the world media. Hovering on this precipice continuously, we have to limit the input and output of calories to Gaza to a certain number, which they then divided on a per capita basis according to the population of Gaza. And of course, they control the population registry, so they know exactly how many people are in Gaza, how many are men, how many women, how many children, and so forth. And they did a whole very complicated series of calculations which I, as an English professor, can't even begin to understand since I don't do math, but they came up with the following number. They realized, or they claimed, that 2,279 calories for every man, woman, and child in Gaza is exactly the amount you need to keep the population at this edge, at this knife edge. And they set about controlling inputs and outputs out of Gaza to keep this number, to aim to make this the target in terms of calories per day per person in Gaza. If you think about an occupation that can determine down to the last calorie your diet and your capacity for nourishment and growth or lack thereof, 
That's an extraordinary thing. If you can think about what it means that a nutrition packet on the back of a box of cereal or whatever is actually a site for a contest between an occupying power and an occupied people, that calorie counting has become part of the machinery of occupation, I think you can understand the nature of the everydayness of the occupation. It's not about, it's not simply about bombing and pushing and killing and disrupting and so forth. It's also about down to the very, very mundane, the very intimate, the very personal level of, again, everyday life, which I think also explains why Israel is the only state in the entire world that, as a matter of standing state policy, has home demolition as one of its basic fundamental day, you know, routine, daily uh, modes of uh, operating. On, on a regular basis, the Israeli state or its agents demolish Palestinian homes or uproot Palestinian olive trees. It's something that's of, of daily occurrence. The most recent report of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that in 2013, 565 Palestinian structures were demolished by the Israelis in the West Bank, which displaced about 805 people, half of them children, rendering them homeless, of course. Um, in, the pa in, this, in the current year, 2014, according to the same office of the UN, uh, 33 demolitions took place just last week, I should say, displacing 47 people. And so far this year, 522 uh, structures have been demolished by the Israelis in the West Bank, rendering almost 1,000 people homeless. But the amazing thing about these acts of violence against people and their trees is that they take place on a really, really small scale. It's one house, one tree, one farmer, one family at a time. It's not large scale. And that's the point of this occupation. It's not something that takes place on a large scale. It's something that takes place drip by drip and drop by drop, slice by slice, piece by piece. Which again, I think, speaks to the nature of the everydayness of it all. Because if it was something taking place on a larger scale, you would understand it in a different kind of way. But when you think, for example, that the Israelis have uprooted since 1967 between 800,000 and 1.5 million olive trees belonging to Palestinian families in the West Bank, and that they've done so not all at once, but rather, as I said, three here and 10 here and five here and 40 here and 102 there, week in, week out, it's an extraordinary way to think about the management of life on an everyday scale, management of occupation on, on an everyday scale. I want to pause and shift now to away from the West Bank and into is, uh, inside Israel itself, because often people talking about Palestine and Israel make a, a too big a distinction, I think, between uh, what happens in the occupied territories and what goes on Israel itself. The occupied territories, we're told, yeah, you might want to talk about apartheid there, but there's no apartheid inside Israel, or it's a different kettle of fish because Israel treats all of its citizens equally and so on and so forth. But in fact, if you look not at the, at the big macro level, but if you zoom down to the level of day-to-day -day life, you notice exactly the same logic unfolding on either side of the line dividing the West Bank and East Jerusalem, or Gaza for that matter, uh, from Israel. The making and reclaiming of terrain inside the state of Israel is just as important to state policy as it is in the West Bank. There are laws restricting who can access what kind of land. A Jewish citizen of Israel, in fact, somebody who's Jewish is not even a citizen, has more access to land inside Israel than a Palestinian citizen of the state. In other words, being a citizen of the state doesn't matter so much in terms of accessing land and other kinds of resources too. Housing, for example, is the same thing. It's rather the identity card or the form of identity the state ascribes to you, whether you want to have that description or not. So, uh, in terms of planning, I think it's clear how that works. We'll talk a little bit more about that if you'd like to. But the amazing thing is that when you think about some of the characteristics of how Israel likes to present itself, for instance, as a site that makes the desert green, as a place that makes the desert bloom, as a state that brings nourishment to what had been desert, and so on and so forth, if you think about Israel's claim to forestation as a, as a wonderful sort of ecological miracle and so forth, um, something that is continually trumpeted, for example, uh, by the Jewish National Fund. If you go to its website, they have tons of things about planting trees in Israel, and you pay, I don't know how much, and you get a tree named after you, etc. in Israel. The Jewish National Fund makes a great deal out of, its, uh, out of its project of forestation in Israel. This is a shot of a Jewish National Fund forest inside Israel. 
The amazing thing about these forests, though, the JNF forest in particular, is that the forest, the, 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 the planning of these forests is directly, I mean, and I mean literally directly, part of the process of reclaiming the land from its original Palestinian uh, indigenous inhabitants. So, for example, where there had been villages, the JNF plants forests over the ruins of the village, literally over the ruins of the village, so that the trees that they're planting come to over, overgrow the ruins of the village and make the village, in effect, disappear. This is a quite remarkable pair of shots of the village of Safuri, one from the 1930s, one from 2006. And you can see what forestation does. Think, then, of forestation. I mean, how much more banal could you possibly get than planting a bunch of trees? But think of forestation, planting trees, as an ethnic cleansing device. I mean, it's, it's again, it's, it's taking this big sort of historical and political concept and bringing it down to the level of planting a stupid tree in the ground. That becomes part and parcel of the process of, of ethnic cleansing that's, of course, integral to what Israel's estate project is all about. So if you go back to those shots that I was taking from across the border in Lebanon, if you look at all these patches of these clumps of forest, here, 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 all of them, basically, each and every one of those represents the ruins of a Palestinian village that was depopulated in 1948, forcibly, of course, by the Israelis. And then the village was systematically pulverized. And if you go and look at the ruins of the village today, in, in every case, you'll find homes or the ruins of homes now gradually being reclaimed by the forest because that's the point of the forest there. It's to erase the presence of the homes and make the former landscape disappear in the name of a new landscape. So again, if you look at it, what do you see? You see a landscape. But if you look at it again, you see history at work. And it's this contact between historical transformation and the banality of the everyday landscape that is so, I think, palpable to me. And what I want to emphasize is that this process began, but it did not end in 1948, in the creation of Israel and the destruction of 1948. There's a village in the south of Israel, in the, in the Nakhav Desert, called Arapib, which is a village of about 300 Palestinian Bedouin sheep herders, mostly. Uh, in, the, in the desert. Uh, they're Israeli citizens, it's important to point this out. Their village, like countless other villages, Palestinian villages, inside the state of Israel, is not recognized by the state. That is, in most of the cases of unrec so-called unrecognized villages, these are villages that predate the existence of the state of Israel. They go back long before 1948 in most cases. It's, but they are, when the state drew up its planning documents in 1965, it kind of didn't include these villages. So as a result, as far as the state is concerned, they don't exist. And because they don't exist, if they see houses there, they're illegal houses because the state didn't give them permits because the state didn't exist when, they, when the houses were built. So at one point in 2010, the Jewish National Fund, one of its forests was slated for the lands in the area around the village of Arapib. So uh, 1,300 Israeli police descended on this village in 2010, July, the summer of 2010. So I, I remind you, it's a village of 300 people. 1,300 police showed up to oversee its demolition. And they demolished the village of Arapi pretty quickly. It's not that big a place, obviously. It doesn't take that long to demolish a small hamlet. The amazing thing about Arapi is that it could have just disappeared at that point. It's, I mean, how many Palestinian villages, hundreds and hundreds, have been just demolished like that? Even though, yeah, it's important that these people are citizens of the state of Israel, they're not refugees and so forth, they're citizens of the state, shows you how the state treats some of its citizens while it builds houses for other citizens, again, according to their ethnic identity. But the amazing thing about Arakib is that after the demolition in July 2010, the villagers rebuilt their village, pretty much right away. And then the Israelis came back and they re-demolished it. And then the villagers rebuilt it. And then the Israelis came back and re-demolished it. And then the villagers rebuilt it. And then the Israelis came back and re-demolished it. And then the Israelis demolished it again, and it was rebuilt again. And they rebuilt it again, and they demolished it. I could go on to the cycle of demolition and, and rebuilding and so forth. As of the last time I checked, which was July this year, July 2014, the village of Arapib has been demolished by the Israelis 69 times in four years. If you think about what it means that a state comes to a village of 300 people and obsessively, 
I mean, there's something, there's something kind of sociopathic, I think, is at this level of the state. Obsessively reduces a village to the dust. And then people rebuild it. You know, but by now, if you've demolished it like 30 times, when they rebuild it, sort of putting sticks together and throwing a you know, uh, thatch over it just to make it, you know, to make to a semblance of a village, and then it's re-demolished and so forth. But do you think that what it means that a state would demolish a village 69 times? It's an extraordinary fact. I want to show you a short video clip of the, one of the demolitions of Al-Aqib, where again, as I said, you can talk about the demolition of Al-Aqib in terms of ethnic cleansing and state planning and uh, these sort of big historical uh, terms, but you can also think about it at the level of when all the state planning, all these abstractions come down to this guy's house and this woman's this, and you know, the, these, it's so small scale. But it's at that very small, very intimate, very local, very individual scale that you realize the magnitude of the giant historical process that it, that it represents. <laughs> So the point I'm trying to make here is that's what history looks like, which is, you know, if you think about it, that's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? That history isn't this abstract force. History is two-by-fours and tarps and things like that, 
bulldozers crushing them and so forth. I mean, it's not just that, of course, but it is also that, among other things. And I think if you want to understand historical transformation, and if you want to understand the political nature of this particular conflict, it's actually at this level that you should begin, with the two by fours, not at the level of abstraction and then come down to the ground. Work from the ground up and see what's going on on the ground at the everyday life, at the level of everyday life, at the level of identity cards and access to diet or access to school or access to housing or access to land, or access to roads or access to whatever, freedom of any kind or lack of freedom of any kind. By conclusion, I want to ask a few questions about resistance and ask what kind of resistance is appropriate to this occupation that takes place primarily at the level of everyday life. I think one of the most fundamental and most often under overlooked aspects of Palestinian resistance to the Israeli occupation is that it also takes place for the mo most part at the level of everyday life. That is, everyday life is the primary arena of struggle between Israelis and Palestinians. It's not bombs and rockets and all that other stuff that, we, that grabs the media because it's so easy to show pictures of those things. It's rather at the level of, for example, people rebuilding their torn down house because they insist on staying on their land. That's an act of resistance that's very, very, very powerful. And one, of course, that the Israelis seek to override. It, resistance consists in the act of farming. Because insisting that you're going to farm your land, insisting that you're going to take care of your olive trees, insisting that you're going to bring in the olive harvest, even though, as I speak, in the peak of the olive harvest in the West Bank, every single day, Jewish settlers or the Israeli army are stealing olives or cutting down trees or stopping people from getting to their trees and so on and so forth, that you insist on doing that is an active part of resisting this politics of occupation. The act of walking, of crossing the landscape on foot because they don't let you drive and they stop you when you go by bus, the act of walking becomes an act of resistance in this kind of context. The act of raising children to defy the odds to insist on the value of life and of education and of culture, the act of teaching, that also becomes also an act of resistance in this context. The schoolroom you can think of as a site of contest, contestation between different sets of values, right? What does it mean to build a school under occupation? What does it mean to try to bring in pencils and papers and materials and teachers and books and all the other stuff? Why is it that the Israelis are so insistent on interdicting the supply of school materials into Gaza, for example. Why is it that again and again and again, in the last bombing of Gaza and in the bombing of Gaza in 2008 and 9, UN schools were hit over and over and over and over again? Why is it that the Israelis bomb schools so often? I think that's something we have to ask ourselves. According to the UN, in the last round of Israeli bombing of Gaza, 118 schools were damaged by the Israelis and 22 of those schools were completely destroyed in the bombing. Why would classrooms be such a threat? Why are school children and the education of school children, why are those also such threats to the Israelis? What is it exactly about schools that makes them such dangerous sites? What does it then mean to resist? Well, resistance, as I said, means insisting on your everyday life, but of course it can also mean it can also mean various forms of protest, right? So the most powerful forms of protest and resistance at this point are ones that are also taking place at the level of, of the everyday. At the site of the wall, for example, uh, when Palestinians dress up as whatever the people are called from that movie, Avatar. Uh, so identifying with the indigenous population of the, whatever the planet is on Avatar. Uh, and with, in other words, being able to speak the language of international cinema and entertainment and so forth, insisting on planting olive trees even when they're torn up or as a matter of protest, uh, insisting on protests not just in the West Bank and, and Jerusalem, but also uh, among Palestinians, citizens of Israel inside the state, which now happens on a much more frequent basis than it used to historically. Those are all, that's where I think one of the main hubs of Palestinian resistance to Israel is at. It's not at, I haven't, I haven't even, I'm about to say the words Fatah and Hamas, I haven't used those words yet because that's not where the resistance is. The resistance is at this level. It's not at the level of uh, men wearing ties, sitting around tables, talking to other men. It's at the level of the street, it's at the level of the everyday. Which brings me finally to the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which came up in the introduction. 
um, because that's become, I think, the leading edge of Palestinian uh, protest and resistance to Israel. Because for an occupation that takes place at the level of the everyday, it makes perfect sense that it's at the level of the everyday that you're also going to set out to resist and contest and try to overturn the occupation. The French company Veolia has become one of the main targets of EDS activism around the world. And it has taken, it has, ta it has, it has paid a very, very heavy financial price for insisting on building, sorry, this light rail system uh, in the West Bank to connect uh, Jewish settlements in the West Bank to Israel proper in contravention, of course, of international law. So there's a very, very powerful and effective uh, series of campaigns, mostly in Europe and Australia, but also increasingly in the US, directed against Veolia because of what it stands for. And if you think about the success of the anti-Veolia campaign and of the extent to which Veolia now wishes it had never embarked on this, on this wretched train project that got them into this mess to begin with, uh, if you think about what that means, what that does to other companies, I think you can, you can get a sense of the, the power of uh, BDS, of the boycotts movement, and, and what it does and the, the ways in which it makes companies think. There's a French company called Garnier that uh, during the bombing of Gaza this summer, uh, there was these, suddenly it was all over the media in Israel that, that Garnier products were being sent to Israeli soldiers on the front as they were you know, in their artillery positions shelling Gaza. And uh, it turns out, G Garnier, the company, very, like within 24 hours, came out issuing all kinds of statements clarifying that we, Garnier, the company based in Paris, have nothing to do with this at all. This is something that's being done at the local level by an Israeli distributor of our goods. It's not us who are backing this up. But the haste with which a, multi a giant multinational corporation now responds to even the threat, the whiff of boycott, divestments, and sanctions is, I think, testament to the power of, of that, which, of course, is modeled on the South African anti-apartheid campaign that, of course, culminated in the 1980s. But this is, it's very prominent, this campaign, in Europe. It's all over the place in Europe. But it's, it's beginning to make itself felt, I think, in the US as well. And it extends, speaking at the level of everyday life, away from simply consumer goods to uh, a music boycott that is now very, very highly developed. There's a number of musicians that have refused to play, gone on the record, made very powerful statements against the occupation, including Elvis Costello, uh, Brian Eno, Roger Waters, many, many others who, who now refuse categorically to play uh, in, in Israel because of this. Uh, one of my favorite examples of the pressures of boycott and of protest against Israel uh, at the level, again, of everyday life, right? And it's, this is by definition nonviolent protest, which I think is the most effective form of protest and resistance, uh, is at, at the level of sport. So, for example, uh, the 2010 Davis Cup tennis match, this is the example I love because it was originally scheduled to be played in Stockholm. It was between Sweden and Israel. It was going to be played uh, in Stockholm at the last moment because the, Israeli, because the authorities in Sweden were anticipating protest. They, at the last second, moved the match to Malmo. So they set up a stadium, a tennis stadium, for these people to play their tennis match. But no observers, there was no audience. They weren't allowed in. And there was a big protest outside, even though it had been moved there at the very last minute, which again speaks to I think the power and the appeal of the BDS movement. What I want to end with those is borders again. Um, I want to come back to the banality of borders. If you look at the border of Gaza, if you look at ma historical maps of the border of Gaza, one of the amazing things is this is the line of Gaza is here, in southern Israel is here. If you look at the map carefully, you can find, uh, if you come up, you can look at it afterwards, I can project it afterwards if you want to see. Uh, you can see how close many of the former Palestinian villages are to, uh, to Gaza. The population of Gaza, as you probably know, is overwhelmingly composed of Palestinian refugees from other parts of Palestine. The reason they're in Gaza now is because they were expelled from their homes and their villages were demolished in 1948. Uh, the reason why they were expelled is simple. It was to create the state that didn't want them because they didn't fit the ethnic composition that the state wanted for itself. Um, but the amazing thing about it is the thought that these people got to Gaza on foot. They walked there. And so if you could just do it a kind of counterfactual, imaginary sort of thought exercise, mind exercise, if you can think about, if you could just open the gates of Gaza, literally just unlock the gates, and say, you can all go home now. These people could literally walk back to, the, to their villages 
which for the most part, these ones in the south especially, were, were bulldozed. Nobody lives there. Like there. There's nothing there. I mean, I showed you pictures of Palestinian villages. Most of the villages were never, it's not like they were put to some other use. They were bulldozed and demolished and nobody lives there. So these people, just think about the fact that if you could just open these gates and let people walk back home, it's as though that's what it takes to end this conflict. It's something as banal as opening a door. Yes, I know there's a giant sort of political set of references and abstractions and arguments and debates and so forth, but like I said, zoom down to reality. Really, literally speaking, open the gates, these guys go home, and the conflict is over. I mean, I know I'm, I'm airbrushing a little bit, but you see my point, I hope, how simple it is. We're often told this is the most complicated conflict in the history of human life, and it's not. It's like most historical conflicts, it's actually not that complicated. It's pretty easy to understand. And hence, the solution doesn't lie in pages and pages and pages of documents and agreements and gentlemen around Green Bay's tables negotiating, et cetera. It's actually really, really easy to solve the problem. Let people go home, let people live as equals, and it's done. That's, that's the end of the conflict, essentially. Um, so think then about the way in which borders, which are you know, in some way, and I began with talking about borders, showing pictures of a very heavily fortified border. Think about borders which are the ultimate sort of expression of po state power and control and domination and so forth, but also think about borders as also the keys to overturning the, the flow of history and, and reversing the current of history and, and reclaiming and repossessing, if you want, the terrain of history. Think about the way in which borders mark, in a way, the site for uh, symbolic contestation of, of Israeli state practices. So, a couple of years ago, there was a series of coordinated protests on Israel's borders with neighboring Arab states that involved Palestinian refugees assembling at the border in many of these cases. And they're quite extraordinary <coughs> to see these, these images from, from 2011 because at some level, again, think quotidian here, think daily, think at the most basic level. At some level, this is a conflict about those gates stopping these people from getting home. And yes, I know there are abstractions. We could talk about those if you want to afterwards. But on the other hand, if you could simply open the gates and let these people go back home, the conflict would be largely, if not entirely, addressed. That's what the conflict comes down to. That's why I think it's best understood at this microscopic, day-to-day, -day, banal level, rather than at the level of abstractions and huge forms of calculus and, and PhD dissertations and so forth that don't really get us that far. So I'll stop there and see if you'd like to discuss other things further. Thank you. <laughs>